a question. What's the link between the rugged beauty of the South Wales Valleys and the ravishing valleys of Northern Italy? Well, me, for a start. I'm Michaela Chiappa, and just like thousands of other Welsh Italians throughout the South Wales Valleys, the Ferraris and the Sidolis, the Brachis and the Fulgonis, the Frankies and the Contis, to name but a few, I'm Welsh-born, but Italian-bred. And I'm equally proud of both my cultures. Is that all right? Yeah. It's going to be curly. I'm going to have a curly cod. Which is why I want to take you on a celebratory journey into the heart of the Welsh Italian community. Please, please. It's a world of the three F's. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Family. You can't buy this. Fun. And food. Food, glorious food. Finito. From gelato. Oh, that's amazing. To fungi. Look at that one. That's a big one. Ravioli to that well-known Italian delicacy. Chips. Oh, I licked my fingers. Oh, I licked it. <laughs> I will reveal our colourful past and how it's shaped what's on every Welsh plate. Oh. And on the annual Welsh Italian exodus to our spiritual home of Bardi, I'll ask, what does the future hold for a unique community as Italian as pasta and as Welsh as Welsh cakes? We are brought up probably more Italian than Italians in the middle of the year. From Bargoy to Bardi, this is my recipe for the true roots of the Welsh Italian job. Summer in the South Wales Valleys. The rain is falling, the sheep are wet, and in the Chiappa household, the females of my family are preparing food for the Welsh Italian social event of the year, a scampagnata. A picnic to end all picnics, whatever the weather. I'm here making a meatball mix, which we're gonna do little mini meatballs and then stick fing um, sticks in them. It's all about finger food, stuff that you can to carry easily to have a feast in a picnic. The scampagnata is like the great Welsh Italian bake off. A little bit more salt. A little bit more. A chance for families from all over the valleys to showcase their culinary prowess. Never too young to learn. <laughs> Although I should warn you that Welsh Italian families are as complicated as they are competitive, including my own. In the kitchen today, we've got Mum, uh, my auntie Hilary, married to our uncle Paul, who was a Ferrari, which is what Mum was. Unfortunately, we got lumbered with Chiappa, not Ferrari. <laughs> and then in the corner down there, we've got my cousin Robbie, Hello. who's a Fulgoni. From, gosh, where are the Fulgonis and what valley are they from? In Italy. But in Wales, I would say, where would you? I would say Ponte, my non or Ponte. Each little valley in Wales has got different pockets of Italian. So the Fulgonis in Ponte, you've got Tambinis, and you've got in the Ronda, another family. So here today we have the Ferraris and the Chiappas from Aberdeer and Hirwine and the Fulgonis from Ponte. Not forgetting the latest addition to our complex family tree, my own daughter, Fiamma. Vuoi assaggiare? Buono? Yum, 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 yum! Fiamma is the first born of the fifth generation of Welsh Italian Chiappas, a dynasty started by my great grandfather, Giovanni Viazzani. He walked all the way to South Wales from Northern Italy in the 1920s, finally settling in Merthyr Tydfil, where he opened the legendary Station Caff. Of course, Giovanni Viazzani was not the first of the Italians in Wales. They began coming to the valleys well over a century ago, tempted here, like so many other nationalities, by the black gold of coal. But while most came to toil down the mines, us Italians brought our love of food, opening coffee shops, sweet shops, ice cream parlours, fish and chip shops, and of course, the brachis, the Italian calves that are now part of the folklore of Valley's life. Serving everything from frothy coffee to steamed pies, the brachy calves were named after one of the first families to open cafes here. 
But there are other names familiar to us all. The Bernis, Ferraris, Sidolis, Viazzanis and the Chiappas. All associated with food and drink. As was the way back in the day, Italians nearly always married Italians in the South Wales Valleys. And over the generations, we Chiappas joined forces with the Viazzanis and the Ferraris. And by the time I came along in the 1980s, I was the newest addition to my dad's 12 first cousins living cheek by jowl on the same street in Merthyr, Lower Thomas Street. An evocative little Italy and a street I left almost 20 years ago. Oh my gosh, such a weird feeling being here. I've got kind of like these butterflies. I've, I've not experienced this in a long time, but I just... It's almost like I've literally just been transported back to my childhood. And the scare, the, the, and the eerie thing about it is these houses here were packed with my family. There were probably, gosh, 25 of us all. So this, was, this flat here at the top was where I was born. And the backyard behind these gates here was interconnecting with my grandparents who lived in this house here. And then that house there is where Sabrina, my cousin, and all her family were. My, my grandmother's brother's family. The house beyond that was Uncle Frank and his family, so another brother. And then this house here was my Auntie Tina. And three out of four of the houses have still got these plaques outside where each family had their own um, name of the village they're from, near Bardi, um, to kind of, I don't know, bring that bit of Italy to this Welsh valley street. It's a really, really, really weird feeling because such a huge amount of memories of us as kids scuttling up and down these streets and grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles. It's, yeah, it's um, getting quite overwhelmed. Sadly, the little Italy of Lower Thomas Street is long gone. But today's Welsh Italian community is still as vibrant and colourful as ever. It's time to get out the picnic baskets, the awnings and the sun and head off to Abergavenny. We are here at the Scampagnata and that is the biggest Italian picnic you can imagine. It happens once a year in Abergavenny. And as you can see, car loads just keep arriving. And people turn up in cars or even vans. I've seen even a little mini lorry one year. And they are burst into the seams with food, not just one type. You've got um, pies, cakes, barbecues. I mean, it, it's not your typical picnic. And it's basically a day for all the Italians to get together, eat, drink, and then have a few games in the middle. Calling team number 11, please. The Scampagnata is the epitome of the three Fs. Food, family and fun. And while the games can get very competitive, it's the rivalry over who could lay on the best, biggest spread that really gets us going. So we've got the Maruzzi family, we've got part Servini. Yeah. So these are more families nestled within the Welsh Valleys. Yeah. And so Ellen has got a torta. Yeah. So this is my mum's torta, torta di patate yeah. and torta di spinaci over there. This is my mum's tomato tart, a bit like a tart tatam. And my mum's roast vegetable tart. This is a big plate of mixed salad, which my sister made. Um, there's some chicory and some beetroot and apple with some pomegranate seeds. And um, this is celeriac, some aubergines, some griddled courgettes. And then over here we've got the antipasti and some roast beef and some just roasted mixed vegetables and another little pea and bean and mint salad. And then there'll be cake and all sorts of things. Like As you there. can see, not your typical pic, because I was trying to explain that this isn't a typical picnic. Where you no, it's not bring a sandwich. A, no. a sandwich, it's like gazebo, <laughs> no. lorry loads of food, yeah. crockery, flowers. Yeah, flowers, yeah. <laughs> The Scampagnata is a tradition that seems as if it's been around forever. And with my parents and their parents before them, I've been coming every year since I was a baby. And if there's one thing I can almost guarantee, it's that at some point the conversation will come around to how Welsh or Italian we feel. 
Franco Tambini was born in Italy and moved to Nelson when he was a young man. But his daughter Louise is Welsh born and Italian bred, just like me. The Welsh are the Italians in the rain, aren't they? <laughs> That's what people say because they're so similar, the cultures, because family is very important and church is very important and food and table and singing and you know and all of that. And so it's assimilated very well from well, you'll never be alone in Wales, will you? No, that's Doesn't true. Doesn't matter where you are, in the, in the pub, in the cafe, in the bus stop, whatever, everybody talks to you. Would you consider yourself Welsh or Italian? I'm Welsh Italian. Okay. It is bonkers because our bloodline is 100% Italian, but my heart is Welsh. You know, that's what I was born with. Especially when we talk about rugby. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, we always get asked. Well, blue. <laughs> She's absolutely. Very loosely, absolutely. Dad and I have had this conversation a lot of times since we awesome. did. And I've said to him, when I first watched the rugby match, he took us to Wales, Italy in the old stadium. I wasn't a rugby fan at all. And he said, Who are you going to support? I said, I just don't know, Dad. I've never watched rugby. I don't know. I sat down as soon as the Welsh team ran out. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, Dad. I'm so tired. I'm so Welsh. It's, My yeah. nonna always used to say, she said, you were the luckiest people on earth because you can cherry pick yeah. the best things about That's Italy it. and the best things about Wales. Absolutely. I think we are so lucky. Lucky. Yeah. Absolutely lucky to have both, you know, cultures and things. And two cultures that blend so well, you know. But also, we've got fantastic families. That's what counts. Well, to me, the root of our is the best is family and food in our family. <laughs> well, well, and the wine. <laughs> well, <laughs> Salute. 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 Another year, another scampagnata. Although I have to admit, it's one of the few things that remain unaltered in the Welsh-Italian community. The most obvious change is that the mainstay of Valley's social life, the Italian calf, has now all but disappeared. Where once there was at least one bracky to every Valley's town, you can now count on one hand those that still remain. But I'm proud to say that the Viazzani Station Calf in Merthyr, founded by my great-grandfather in the 1920s, not only remains open, but is still in our family run by Mario, one of the cousins I grew up with on Lower Thomas Street. While still selling traditional dishes made from my family's recipes, Mario's realistic about the calf's future. How does it feel to be the last one It's standing? funny, it's just all changed. It's all changed. But this place is still very much at the heart of Merthyr. You still come in here and it's still bustling, no. but it's it's like someone said to me earlier, but what's it like? I said, it's still busy, yeah, it's no. just not the same. Like, no, you used to come here years ago and they'd be like, Guaranteed six or seven family members yeah, all no. the time. But that, that's just that's just the way things are. I mean, people move out to family businesses and they they do other things. You know, it's just the way it all goes. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm one of the, the few people that's still doing this line of yeah. business these days as a traditional cafe in the valleys. Yeah. You know, as they used to be. Do you think but, um, your boys? You got three no. boys. You don't think they'll no, I don't follow you? Well. I don't think so. No. Really? No, I don't. Would you I... want them to? Um, I guess it's up to I, them, isn't it? It's entirely up to them. I, I don't know if they will. I, 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 I'd encourage them to do other things, personally. Yeah. I would encourage them certainly to do other things. But it's yeah. a hard business, isn't it? It is. People? It is. You know, and it's harder. It's, it's harder all the time. Of course, the real irony about the slow demise of the Brackies is not that they've been forced out of business by the fast food outlets and takeaways, is that they've been done for by that most Italian of all things, the coffee shop. But us Welsh Italians are nothing if not hard-working and entrepreneurial. So we've moved with the times, and some of us, like these two Welsh Italian brothers, were actually way ahead of this high street revolution. Do you want a hand? No, no, no. Come manage that, can you? Yeah, yeah. So this is my dad, Graziano Chiappa, and my uncle Laz. And this is their coffee warehouse tucked away on a Merthyr Tidville industrial estate. <laughs> Way back in the 1980s, Dad and Uncle Laz became the first Costa Coffee agents outside of London. The Costa family came from Parma to the English capital, where there was another strong Italian community. And as their business blossomed, they began to franchise out to fellow Italians like my family. Mr Costa clearly knew his beans and had a bit of advice for Dad. I remember Sergio Costa saying to me, in the great American gold rush, it wasn't the guys who were panning for gold that made the money, it was the guys who were selling the picks and the shovels. So he said, trust me, Graziano, go out and sell coffee and you'll make a good living out of it. 
and it started from there. So Dad was in at the off, and as out went the frothy coffee, in came the skinny lattes, flat whites, americanos and macchiatos. Now there's as many coffee shops on Welsh High Street as once there were brackies. And Dad is flat out distributing Italian beans and machines to independent shops throughout Wales and the West Country. Not that everyone in the Welsh Italian community saw the coffee revolution coming. On Barry Island, Marco's Caff is now world famous for its association with Gavin and Stacey. But until Dad told him what's occurring in the world of coffee, I can check my wallet. Yeah, it's still there. Thank you. Marco had been happy shoveling buckets and spades. I know. So what? You didn't used to do coffee? Nothing at all here. No, we just. We and just... you weren't convinced coffee would go? No, because he said, could I make good money on on buckets and spades? Yeah. And I said to him, Marco, if they buy a bucket and spade, they buy one. If you make nice coffee, they come back and they have two and three coffees. Do you remember I lent you? Do you remember I lent you the first machine because you were too, too tight to buy it? I wasn't too tight. You were too I, tight to buy it. No, 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 I was cautious. Cautious. And I lent it to you to try. Uh -huh. Do you remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, since then, I bought you a Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> right. But if I said to you five years ago that you'd be sitting on the promenade on Barry Island drinking a latte espresso cappuccino mocha or whatever. They thought I'm not, well, I'm not saying it, but they thought I'm crazy. And look at it now. Whatever its size, strength or colour, it's fair to say that most people associate coffee with Italy. But there's one staple of the Welsh diet that on the face of it is about as Italian as Barra Brith. And yet it was largely introduced to Wales by the Italians. Fish and chips. The first English chippy was opened in London in the 1860s by a Jewish immigrant called Joseph Marlin. But it was the Italian immigrants who imported them to Scotland, Ireland and Wales. So a lot of Italian families in South Wales have started their business with fish and chips. And this place is one of my dad's favourites. Frank Romanello has been running his busy chippy for over 40 years. But having started with a cafe in Aberdeer, he relied on some Welsh Italian know how when he first jumped from the frying pan to the fryer. How did you feel starting up having never done this before? Um, I was very lucky to meet a person down here which I'd never met before. And he is Italian as well, which he had the chip shop, Joe Marazzi from. Here we go, uh, who's got Verdi's. Who now yeah. owns Verdi's. The day I opened, he, he sent his father to help me peel the potatoes. He turned up to do all the frying and, and serving, and I owe my success to Joe, otherwise I don't know what I would have done. And the secret to the success is now in the hands of Frank's four sons. And it's all in the batter, apparently. OK, we're going to make some batter now, because it's getting a bit busy and we need oh. to put some, put some fish in. Right. So we start off, it's cold water. OK. Has to be cold water? Yeah, the batter does come out better. It's the flour. So this is batter flour. This is batter flour. Go on, I'll help. Go on, you, you can mix it in, you whisk it in. Nice consistency, not, not too watery, not too thick. You sort of get the eye for it. You're a true Italian, yeah. you're not weighing anything. You don't weigh anything. A no. bit of this, a <laughs> bit of that. What we do now, we'll get, um, we're get. we going to get a nice fillet of fish from Hang the fish here. All right, yeah. let's have a go. Do you put it in with your hands? No, with a fork. So i got to dip that you're into there. No, 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 you're going to take this, I'm... and then you're going to put that in there, and then take the fork underneath it. Okay. And then Okay, so in there like that, is it? Yeah. And when it goes in, try and bring flat so it doesn't curl. Ready? Oh, that's good. Is that all right? Yeah. It's going to be curly. I'm going to have a curly cod. Well, they do come out. Sometimes they come out like that if you don't <laughs> put them in flat, yeah. yeah. See, all these little things. Oh, it's already curling, I can see. No, it's looking good, I think. What do you do on a Saturday? <laughs> looking for a job? These things take years to learn yeah. to get the technique right. So that's why we don't franchise to anybody because... Other than your family. Other family. If they're using our name, they've got to, you know, it's got to be done the way we do it. Yeah. It's yours. It's looking all right, is it? <laughs> For a first time. Yeah. Having just about pulled off a crispy cod without getting battered, can I wrap up my day by passing the ultimate chip shop challenge? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Rewind, rewind. So you bring this up. Yeah. Fold it over. Yeah, yeah. Tuck, and then. Yeah. Okay. Can I have a go? Yeah. Ooh, 
Okay, this is the tricky part now. Yeah. This one up. Then corner. Hang on. Oh, 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 oh. oh I licked my fingers! Oh, 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 oh. oh I licked it! <laughs> oh, I failed. <laughs> Everyone's watching me. Talk about under pressure. Yeah, this one up. Oh, I split the bag. There we go. A bit embarrassing, really, but I'm not sure I was that finger licking good. On the surface, the Welsh Italian community appears as robust and vital as it ever was. People like Nicky, Marco, my dad, and Uncle Laz are continuing or adapting traditional businesses. And the larger community still gathers for that annual scampagnata. But there's one interesting trend that I've noticed developing with my generation of Welsh Italians the call to the motherland. This is Bardi in northern Italy. It's the town and surrounding district from where the vast majority of Welsh Italian families originate, including my own. Today, it's a prosperous and colourful market town. But at the turn of the 19th century, when crops were continually failing and life was tough and harsh, thousands left these valleys on foot to join the exodus to the newly prosperous South Wales valleys. And now, some of the Welsh Italians are making the return journey. This is Lucia and Sabrina, two of my dad's first cousins I grew up with in Merthyr. While their parents stayed in Wales, Sabrina, Lucia and four other siblings have all emigrated to the Bardi area. So, Lucia, why, why did you come to Italy? Climate, I suppose, as well, had a lot to do with it. When you were 21, you just said to your parents... Yeah, I'm going. I asked them if I could go when I was 18, but they said, no, finish <laughs> school and then you can leave. And uh, some came over, 21, and I just stayed on. Just stayed you here. stayed here since yeah, then? And, and everyone six, else followed. All six of you, but your parents stayed in Wales? My parents loved Wales. My parents absolutely loved Wales. They were very much part of the community in Merthyr Tidville. Um, and they absolutely loved... They would never have moved back. And I know that Sabrina has pangs about her move too. You were always, like, missing, gagging to come back to Wales. What are the things you really, really miss now, today? I miss Merthyr. I really miss Merthyr. I think I'm the only one who really misses it. It's just home. I miss the shopping. I miss the people. Yeah, you you people. can't beat the Welsh people for hospitality. Um, I love living in Italy, and I do feel at home in Italy, but it's not like when I come home that I really feel like I'm at home in Wales. If you had to pick, do you feel more Welsh or Italian? People say, where do you, you can see, I've still got a, a strange accent. People say, you're not Italian, Italian. I say, no, I'm Welsh, and I'm very proud to say that I am. But um, I think you feel a bit of both, actually. But if you had to pick one? I, Italian, yes. Because yes. of just the, well, the yeah, way you've yeah, been brought been up? Yeah, brought up. I've been living here 30 years, and um, that's how I feel. Tabs, yeah. you? I don't know, because when you're in Wales, you don't feel Welsh. And when you're in Italy, you don't feel Italian. For me, I don't yeah. feel completely Italian. I don't know, Mick. I honestly can't say one over another. So in I'm rugby? Between Wales and Italy. Oh, the Welsh. God, they're ten times better. <laughs> can't but that means you're going just because no, they but, win. But yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Italians can't play rugby. The eternal Welsh-Italians dilemma. You don't feel fully Welsh, and yet you don't feel fully Italian either. And please, don't get me started on the rugby. But there is one arena where we Welsh Italians always feel fully at home. Food. Wherever, whatever, especially if it's free. So I'm heading back to the South Wales Valleys, where I'm going to let you in on a little-known secret that proves that the Welsh and the Italians are truly in tune. Fungi. So every September, the Welsh Italians in the valleys get very excited because at this time of year, you will often find porcini mushrooms in the valleys around us. So porcini mushrooms are a type of mushroom that come from our area back in Italy, Bardi, Borgotaro. They're very famous for these really strong flavoured, delicious mushrooms and they're very expensive. So every September, my dad, my uncle, my nonno when he was alive, we'd all get together go trekking in the forests, in the valleys, looking for the fresh porcini. My passion for porcini comes from my dad Graziano and my uncle Laz. And theirs comes from my grandparents. 
Well, no one used to pick them in Italy, didn't you? And then he f discovered them in this country when he went shooting once. Oh, was there? Huh? I've oh, walked no. down this lane with Norn when he stopped, smelt mushrooms, and we went in the hedge, and there we found a bag full. <laughs> so I guess you guys haven't inherited that. No. Much as I would love to tell you exactly where we are, it's more than my life's worth. There's some fierce rivalry in the Welsh-Italian Porcini picker circles, so we keep our secret stashes very close to our chest. If we do indeed find any. That is definitely not a mushroom to pick. I'm not going to pick it up. Lethal red caps aside, it's been very unseasonable Welsh weather for mushrooms. It's been too dry. It was one year, but the head's gone, look. But that's, that was definitely a porcino, look. That was definitely one. Right. Where's he gone now? Right. You won't find any there. She's found one. Yeah, what? He's found, he's found one. Uh, look at that one. That's a nice one, that. That's a big one. There we go. You really shouldn't do this unless you're with someone who knows what they're doing because there are some which are really similar. Like, Laz found a stalk over there and I would never have picked that up because I wouldn't be confident that that tiny stalk would definitely be a porcino. And with a big one in the basket, Dad goes on to show that he's inherited a nose for sniffing out porcini. Oh, well, there he is. What have you found, Dad? Thousands over there, Mick. Really? Let's have a look. That's great ones. Look at that. Oh, good hunt, Dad. Come on. Time to get this golden stash back home and rustle up some mushrooms a la Mirtha. Oh. Did you find many? Yeah, we found quite a few. What have you got? Flour, garlic and parsley. There's just enough light to cook al fresco with the help of Mum, Dad and my daughter Fiamma. This really is a simple dish. I toss the porcini in some flour and then saute them in the butter. Tell me when to go with the garlic and the parsley. OK, garlic first. Dad's in charge of the garlic. And the parsley. Go on. Right, that's it, that's not. E pronto. Ready. Come on, vieni. Va vieni a mangiare. You can get more food inspiration from me on bbc.co.uk forward slash Wales. So this is a tradition that my nonno, my grandparents and many of the Welsh Italians brought from Italy. And since I can remember, since I was a little girl, September was a big month for the Italians in Wales. It was the month of hunting the porcini and then enjoying them round a table with lots of people and usually a bottle of wine. Next time on The Welsh Italian Job... That's amazing. ..I get to sample the secrets of proper packer Italian ice cream. Things get heated in the kitchen with my mum and my sister. Who's the Italian chef? And I get to meet some familiar faces in unusual places when I visit Bardi, the Welsh capital of Italy, for the annual Welsh Italian Festa delle Migrante. A presto and see you next time. Next time is next Sunday at half past six here on BBC One Wales.